Good evening. My name is Susan Stigant, and I am the director of the Africa program at the United States Institute of Peace. Welcome to our first conversation in the series, Why All the Coups? This week, the Biden-Harris administration will host the Summit for Democracy to activate its commitment to renew democracy in the United States and around the world as an essential priority to meet the unprecedented challenges of our times. As conversations take place about addressing and fighting corruption, promoting respect for human rights, and defending against authoritarianism, it is impossible to ignore what the UN Secretary General has called an epidemic of coups. The number of coups and coup attempts in 2021 matches the highest point in this 21st century. And we are concerned about the impacts of instability, undermining democratic progress and human rights, and the acceleration of cycles of violence in countries grappling with conflict. While the headlines about coups often point to a backsliding of democracy or political transition gone wrong, there is no one narrative, particularly in Africa. We are also interested in drawing forward the stories of the responses to coups. These include narratives about the organizing and mobilization by youth, women, civic and political organizations. The decisions by international, continental and regional organizations to uphold norms of constitutional change of government. The mediation efforts to facilitate negotiations and reach new political agreement about how to move forward together and intense discussions about what security means, for whom, and who provides it. In short, the narratives about the hard, courageous work of peace and democracy. So today we will focus on Sudan, and I am delighted to be joined by three distinguished panelists. Ahmed Kaduda, the former, former senior policy advisor in the Ministry of Cabinet Affairs in the government of Sudan. Hala al Karib, the Regional Director for the Strategic Initiative for Women in the Horn of Africa, and speaking today in her capacity as an independent activist. And Joe Tucker, Senior Expert for the Greater Horn of Africa at the United States Institute of Peace. For Sudan, we are not just talking about one coup that you may have been tracking in the media on October 25th, but in fact, two critical coups over the last two years and several attempts in between. So let's dive right into our conversation and start with some reflection on the 2019 coup. Joe, I'm going to turn to you first and ask if you can help us to set the scene, starting back in 2018, 2019, when the political transition in Sudan started. What, what in your view, sparked that 2019 coup? Thank you, Susan. It's really a, an important question because in, in Sudan, like everywhere else in the region, history and political history especially, definitely matters and I want to sort of focus on on two things what what came technically before the coup and what led to this frank frankly opening for the military to act as it did so as many people know there were a lot of protests that led to what happened in 2019 and you know on the surface these protests that began in December of the previous year were really Frust grounded in, in extreme frustrations among the population, various elements of society um, on what on the surface was economic reasons, a real sharp rise in the cost of bread and basic commodities, um, a re reduction in, in subsidies, uh, inflation really across the board. Um, so, so that aspect of the protest that led up to what in effect was a coup that overthrew the Bashir government really grounded in the frustration um, from, from the public. And I want to note here what others have documented is that a lot of those protests were, were from relatively prosperous areas um, in and around Khartoum that some say benefited from the previous regime in sort of a knock-on economic impact. Some people refer to this as sort of the inner periphery um, areas that were hit hard, places like Apera, Bogmedini, Port Sudan, Gedaref. And so those places that really are sometimes um, out of the international eye, so to speak. Um, you know, and I think uh, a question we might come to after is what did that mean for areas in the more traditional periphery, Darfur, Southern Kordofan, Blue Nile, what impact did what was happening there have on this, given that a lot of the focus was on protests related to the economy in these areas that people don't see as the quote normal periphery. Um, I don't really want, of course, don't want to discount the fact that there was, of course, a lot of popular anger, resentment, 
of the Bashir regime, um, decades of real um, depredation and, and significant crackdowns on political and civic forces. Obviously, that did play a, a role into this. And, and here I also want to note that as the protests advanced, as 2019 started and got underway, there was a real sense of a growing organization, unity among political and civic forces, among unions on the ground. And I think that that was taking things to the next level, so to speak, as opposed to uh, prior protests um, in the years following South Sudan's independence in 2011. I think that really got the attention of the military and the ruling elite. And so, of course, then we saw what has happened uh, prior times in Sudanese uh, history, the military um, intervening um, on the surface, intervening on the side of the street, so to speak. And I think just to note briefly here, I think it's important to know that there were a lot of fractures among regime elements, among the ruling party going back years, also sort of jockeying and, and differences of opinion among the military and the intelligence services. Um, and I think that sort of a lot of those gray areas, frankly, created space for the military to to act as it as it did. I think in retrospect, they they did act um, to take sort of the side of the street to unseat President Bashir in the top tier of the National Congress Party. I think they were acting um, in their economic interest. I think they were acting in the sense that they always like to be seen as a protector of the nation. They obviously wanted a seat at the table as as this um, went forward. There was also some internal discontent on President Bashir making the decision um, to run in the 2020 elections. So again, I think we'll I'll leave it there briefly. But the last thing I would say is that, you know, in the years prior to this, there were always the threats of coups, especially one incident, particularly in November 2012. So sort of taking stock of those, those internal fissures among the key elites is important then. And I think it's important now. And I think this highlights one big question that that Hala and Kaduda can speak to uh, more, more correctly than I can, is that this really gets to the point of what is the ultimate role, if any, of the Sudanese military and security services in politics in the country. That's this underlying theme throughout all this. So I'll, I'll leave it at there, but, but thanks again for the question because it's important. Thanks, Joe. Um, Kaduda, I want, I want to turn to you because we talk about the protests as requiring a tremendous amount of organization. Um, but I don't think anybody who hasn't been part of that organizing and the years that go into it um, can really grasp the intensity um, and, and the structure um, and, and the courage and energy that has to go into that. And I'm, I'm particularly interested in hearing a bit more from you about um, what was happening in the organizing of the mass protest movement? What was, what was the response where, you know, as Joe said, so often military say you're stepping in to defend the people um, and, and what happened to really uh, take the position and push forward with the necessary political negotiations? I remember at the time, um, Sudanese kept saying, we are not Egypt. We will not act in the same way that the street act in Egypt, acted in Egypt. And it was like this weight of history, not just Sudan's history, but some global history in terms of mass movements and the trajectory of coups really sat on the shoulders of Sudanese. So take us, take us back a little bit to, to that time. Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for organizing this panel. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. I think the political mobilization uh, has really had a, an accumulated legacy over the years, throughout the 30 years of Bashir's rule, uh, whether it was the student movements and the universities uh, moving forward to the, uh, the establishment of youth groups, uh, such as Gudifna and Change Now, uh, and then the series of, uh, you know, aborted uh, mobilization against the regime, whether in 2012, 2013, uh, in September, uh, and again, moving forward, leading up to 2018. I think what made the mobilization different in 2018 uh, is the fact that uh, it really began uh, organically. Uh, in many ways, it was not driven by the political elites or, or uh, you know, the street was uh, basically, as Joe said, uh, reacting to the context on the ground. Uh, it was clear that the regime had uh, basically uh, reached the end of its lifespan. Uh, what we did see, however, was the fact that uh, there was 
a consensus amongst the political elite to really uh, let the Sudan Professionals Association take the forefront when it came to mobilizing. Uh, and what was interesting is that, you know, uh, I, I worked on some research with a colleague of mine, Dr. May Hassan at the University of Michigan, uh, looking at the mobilization at the street. And what we found was that there were two distinct uh, periods in the uprising itself, starting from uh, late December until the end of January. So for a period of about a month and a half, the mobilization was largely driven and organized through a series of centralized protests. So the Sudan Professionals Association would call for protests at a particular time, at a particular location that was known to uh, both the protesters and the regime itself. And that in many ways gave the advantage to the regime because you declared the location and the time and it was a disadvantage to the protesters because as people came to protest, they were in many ways uh, dislocated from the areas that they know. Uh, they were coming to a centralized place, whether it was downtown Khartoum or Umdurman or Bahri or other uh, central marketplaces in other cities around the country. Uh, and that gave an advantage to the regime in its ability to uh, suppress the protest without any sort of um, um, concern uh, for the people doing the oppression. However, the second phase was beginning from about uh, January 19th, 20th, up until April 5th. Uh, and that period was marked by the protests being relocated to the neighborhoods. And every neighborhood would actually uh, declare a day that they're going to be going out. And the nature of the mobilization also changed in ways that uh, wasn't easily suppressed. So whether it was Burri, whether it was Shambat, Kalakla, these various neighborhoods around Khartoum, for example, and I'm, I'm focusing here on Khartoum because of its importance to the, uh, to the revolution. Obviously other cities also were central uh, in draining the energy of the security apparatus. But if we look at the mobilization in Khurtum, uh, the move of the protest to the neighborhoods did several things. First, it allowed the protesters to have the upper hand because they knew the territory. They were, you know, more knowledgeable and it actually gave the advantage, uh, took the advantage from the security apparatus. And what we found in the research is that uh, oftentimes, whether it's the police or even the security, uh, the National Intelligence Service, the people that were deployed in the neighborhoods were of those neighborhoods. So there were social ties that made it difficult for them to oppress as severely as they would have been able to do in central Khartoum, for example. So several people told us that uh, the police would come to them and they would know these police officers and they would say, you know, please burn the tires in the street and get out of our way. We don't want to beat you up. We don't want to arrest you. So that social network, moving the protests to the neighborhoods, really allowed the protest movement to start building these intra-neighborhood networks, which were the, 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 the seeds of what later became the resistance committees and the neighborhood committees. And these neighborhood committees then started creating bonds of trust and eventually allowed them to better mobilize and organize. That period continued until April 5th until uh, the call by the Sudan Professionals Association for a, uh, a centralized protest on April 6th. That call for centralized protest uh, was again aimed at basically confronting the military and directing people to go to the uh, general command of the armed forces. Uh, the beginning of that day, uh, there was actually no plan to have a sit-in. Uh, the sit-in was called for later in the afternoon when there were you know, hundreds of thousands, uh, arguably upwards of close to a million people, showed up in central Khartoum and occupying this central place. Then the third phase of the mobilization began at that point. The people who came to the protest came with those networks that they built in the neighborhoods. So when they would come to the protest in the sit-in, they would come with 
several people. It wasn't just themselves or their friends. It was it was a, a whole network almost. And that sit-in created an opportunity for those at that point isolated neighborhood networks to then create intra neighborhood linkages and it created this uh this culture of the resistance committees as really being able to operate independently and i think that's what uh what marks sudan's uprising and makes it unique is that the street is now almost autonomous it has its own brain trust in the neighborhood committees in their ability to communicate in their ability to organize and facilitate of course the role of the internet is central here the internet was central initially in, through the use of uh, social media with the sudan professionals association but it really helped in helping coordinate however the sit-in made it possible for these intranetworks to kind of you know Inter these networks to intermingle that allowed them to even survive a month-long shutdown of the internet in uh, June of 2013 after the massacre. So I think I think the protests really are now going to build on this legacy of the uprising and continue to create a very strong resistance to both the military and the putschist, but as well as to any elite that are interested in, uh, you know, co-opting uh, the, the the protest movement moving forward uh, as a reaction to the October 21 coup. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Kaduda. Um, Hala, I want to bring you into the conversation. Um, and Joe's talked about the political history that led to the drivers for the coup itself. Kaduda has talked about some of the organizing that took place, and and I I'd, I'd love to hear more from you about what what were the aspirations of the Sudanese people going into the mass protest movement in resisting the coup and in setting forth this really I think singular political agreement between civilians and the military that in theory set forth this this plan um, for for the political transition in the country because I think I think we often get so focused on those who lead the coup and their interests and the the norms and values that they may or may not be violating we sometimes forget what are the aspirations of of the people men and women young and old across entire geographies um, who are really seeking to see a change um, in in their country um, and for the region, and I think as, as an example globally. Thanks, Susan. Um, and, and thanks for bringing that up. Um, um, well, um, I always, you know, I'm someone who has been traveling across Sudan for the past 20 years. And um, I, you know, as a Sudanese, I would definitely, um, um, I'd be able to say that Sudanese has a um, a very unique appreciation for um, the plural nature of their culture and identity, which is um, something that um, it's very interesting that it's always been um, assumed it's the opposite. But um, um, I, I think what happened um, in 2019 and the whole scene of the sittings um, um, you know, and in terms of how how people they came together from across the country, and it's it, it's actually beyond neighborhoods because um, if we look at um, and, and clearly remembered and documented that many times, you know, seeing um, uh, villages, whole villages, they migrated from Darfur, they migrated from the mountains, migrated from Blue Niles, and they set their tents and they came there with the hope for, for justice, with the hope, you know, everyone came in with their grievances, you know, and, and they came into this place assuming that this is, you know, this is where when we are going to, to be able to speak about, you know, decades of grievances and then, you know, eager to interact and to see each other again after years and years of polarization and division that the country has lived through under the control of, 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 the, of the NCB and the Muslim Brotherhood. It was, it was amazing how, you know, as if 
those 30 years never happened. And one of the stories that I remember very well, because I used to go and, um, you know, and engage in political debates and, and things like that. And I remember um, uh, I was speaking about women rights and one of the young men um, who is from the far north, he came in and he said, I think women can never be equal to men. I, I think, um, you know, and, and he was saying that and he was very calm. And, and he said, I'm saying that because this is what my religion told me and I strongly believe in that. So I started arguing with him. And then the crowds kept increasing around me. And we are standing in front of the army head commanders. There were soldiers passing by. There were a lot of people. It was such an interesting debate that went on for, for more than two hours. And in my mind, I was debating religion, a very sensitive topic. This is a country that has been controlled by militant Islamists for um, 30 years. You know, I am surrounded by people from every a corner of the country, you know, and yet, you know, average people, they are not educated, they are street vendors, they are villagers, they are just people. And they were quite open and they were quite eager, you know, to listen to the conversation. And many they would agree and those who would disagree, you know, um, they would disagree politely or, or they would just you know, smile and leave, you know, and, and, and things like that. So this level of tolerance and ability to engage and, and, and to speak to each other, you know, I, I think this is one of the most remarkable legacy um, um, of, of, of Sudan and Sudan political history. It has to be impressed. And this is, you know, what's actually, this is uh, why Sudanese are very much insisting, despite the disparity, despite what's happening, you know, to navigate um, a peaceful route um, uh, for, uh, for, for, for their democracy. And I think, you know, what, what's happening in Sudan at the moment, you know, is, um, is that it's, uh, it's clearly challenging the concept of um, strong men, that Western institutions and Western countries and, and mindset has been um, kind of um, adopting since, um, you know, the post colonial modern states in terms of how we should be ruled. I, I think Sudanese are currently challenging um, that mindset. And, and, um, and I think they are clearly enabling um, not only the world, but also the Sudanese elites, you know, to see and to reflect, you know, on the fact that, you know, this is a country that's, um, you know, culturally and, and is very pre much prepared to impress plurality. It's very much um, um, willing to impress, you know, um, its diversity and, um, you know, Sudanese has proven, you know, for the past two years, we have endured a very, very harsh times. Every trick on the book has been played on, you know, on the potentials of democracy uh, by, by the military. Having said that, you know, uh, people have been extremely patient and, and they are willing um, to, um, to endure with the hope that they are going to move forward into, into a democratic system. Yeah. I think we often get so uncomfortable with those sense of difficult debates and, and conflicts and also thinking about our own respective role. It's so important to remember to listen to those, those many narratives. And before, before we turn entirely to what's happening today, to, to the coup um, that just happened in October, um, I, I want to shift us to talk about the role of external actors back in 2019. Um, I remember um, as, the, as the protest movement was developing, I was, I was sitting in Addis Ababa at the, the chair of the African Union, and we were watching so closely to see what the African Union Peace and Security Council will do, would do. Um, and I think we're struck that at that moment, um, they suspended Sudan immediately following the coup, deployed mediators, 
um, and continue to engage. And I think in, in many ways, it was held up as a way for the AU to, to stand behind its charter and its principles. Um, at the same time, um, there was engagement from Gulf countries, um, from Egypt. Uh, I'm using engagement, not making any judgment yet. So I'm going to turn to all of you to, to help me to understand and help our, our, our listeners to understand whether what those roles were. Um, the United States was deeply engaged, the Troika, UK, Norway, and the US, the EU, um, the, the regional actors, Russia has been involved in Sudan, China has interests in Sudan. So, so I, I'd like to turn to each of you and hear a little bit about your perspective of what, what was that external influence role. Um, and, and in a moment where we're thinking about the global construct and how that's shifting, where, where did different powers um, play into what was eventually the, the resolution and the agreement that was, that was reached um, in 2019? And, and the conflicts let, that led up to it itself. Um, Kaduta, I'm gonna to turn to you first for, for this question. Sure. Uh, I think the international community played a, a central role in 2019. Uh, you know, the, uh, I mean, largely, I would say, driven by the African Union uh, and uh, the role of uh, Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, as well as the role of the, the Troika led by the U.S., uh, there was a significant uh, exerted uh, pressure in order to come to an agreement. But I think the one of the issues is that the international community uh, really did not understand the complexities, um, didn't have the complexities of the uh, various uh, problems facing Sudan at that point and the transition. And there was this urgency to push for an agreement, regardless of what it, what it looked like. Uh, and initially, uh, after the uh, June uh, 30th protest, which really forced the Transitional Military Council to come back to the negotiating table. The FFC uh, at the time really had the upper hand and they could have leveraged that popular support for a much better agreement. Uh, and in fact, there were negotiations that immediately began after that in Addis Ababa uh, with the uh, Sudan Revolutionary Front in July of 2019 uh, for about three weeks. There was momentum to kind of come to a, a you know, a really big tent uh, position. However, the international community really pushed very hard to come to any sort of agreement that would basically create this partnership uh, that was more or less uh, in gave the upper hand in some ways to the military. Uh, I think that pressure doesn't, again, understand the complexities of Sudanese politics. As I like to say, you know, in Sudan, uh, as in many parts of, of Africa, uh, the bus leaves when it is full. It does not leave on time. And, and unfortunately, the bus was not full for a proper agreement to really create the necessary institutions for a successful transition to democracy. Transitions to democracy are very difficult. Uh, in fact, with a legacy of autocracy for so long, they're possibly impossible in a place like Sudan. But when the international community comes and puts pressure in a way that gives the military more or less all that it wants, then that's certainly not pushing for the democratic transition. Adding to that, I think complexities of the of the region, you know, there is a, a contagion effect of democracy. You know, Sudan is surrounded entirely by non-democratic countries. And there, you know, the region prefers autocracy. And for democracy to flourish, it's very difficult in a context in which all the countries around you have an interest to control the destiny of the country and to install an autocracy that will serve their own interests. And finally, I think when it comes to the international dynamics, I think the role of the United States was also very, very important. Um, uh, historically, and even today, uh, I think, I think we'll talk about that later when we talk about uh, the, the current coup. Thank you. Thanks, Kaduta. 
Um, Hala, I want, want to open it up, up to you. And I wanted to share that I remember um, seeing signs in the protests that were, were specifically resisting interference by the UAE, by Saudi Arabia, in some instances by the United States, um, by Russia. And, and I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit um, about the, the feeling in the midst of those demonstrations about the role that external actors were, were playing. And was there, was there a sense that they were standing beside the, the aspirations of, of the Sudanese people that you so, so articulately laid out? Well, um, I definitely think there is an issue of trust, particularly when it comes to the role of the United States and the other Troika country. Um, from the streets. And I do remember in 2019, um, you know, the uh, extensive conversations about the soft landing and the reconciliations with elements of Bashir's regime of the Muslim Brotherhood. That was very intense and serious conversations. And some of the activists like myself who were not part of that conversation, we were actually isolated you know, um, and sort of as being quote unquote radical, you know, um, and the truth is, you know, we were, and, and, you know, anyone who knows Sudan very well, you know, will definitely understand that there is no soft landing with the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, um, those are really a, a very determined group that they are there to stay. And you know what we are living through at the moment speaks to that. Um, you know this uh, persistence. I, I definitely believe, and you know the uh, obsession with preservation of the of the political organization of the Muslim Brotherhood, even if changing allies and masking new forces and all those things. So. So to a large extent, I think the international community at some point has played that game at a time where the Sudanese were completely, you know, at a point where they, they had no acceptance, not only for Bashir, but for the Muslim Brotherhood as an organization, you know, and for political Islamists. And this is very important part of the conversation that often not being addressed, that the 30 years of Bashir's regime, it wasn't Bashir, it was a political structure that was, you know, um, has its laws, has its policies, and it was 100% focused on, on repressing um, Sudanese people, you know, and, um, and, and, and then this led to, uh, you know, to uh, eventually, of course, the secession of South Sudan that has, you know, um, uh, created a lot of grievances and anger among many Sudanese and the, you know, the, um, what, what happened in Darfur and, uh, and the war crimes that was committed in communities you know, that has been, you know, stable communities, productive communities, they are, they became displaced and, and all those things. And then that discourse of polarization that constantly, um, you know, the Islamist has continued to create it and to generate. Um, so for, for the Sudanese people, they felt that, um, you know, that a sense of betrayal that is happening, you know, um, in terms of, you um, um, you know, um, an engineering of, of, of political change and uh, sidelining the people, which is basically, you know, uh, something that is, um, I would say, um, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's extremely colo of colonial nature. You know, it doesn't match, you know, um, um, concepts of democracy doesn't match concepts of human rights and civil rights, you know, so, so that was, um, um, that was one of the, um, when you talk about, about the intervention, the other important thing, you know, we, we need to remember also that, you know, um, UAE and Saudi Arabia, they always dealt with Sudan as um, a proxy country. So the, you know, they're, perception store, which is quite interesting, you know, such a massive country like Sudan, you know, um, that has all this complexity to be minimized into a source of mercenary soldiers 
or you know um, lands where they could cultivate to generate more weeds or uh, or to get um, you know um, um, gold or so so that perception that has been um, actually, um, you know, because, because this is how Bashir ruled Sudan. I mean, Bashir, he constructed that, you know, that for his own survivor and his group and his political organization, that Sudan, for him to stay, you know, he would do whatever it takes, you know, and, and he made out of Sudan um, um, a country that's actually um, a, a proxy country where um, they provided services um, for for the neighbors, I mean, the situation with Egypt, I believe, it's completely different, you know, and it has its historical um, dimension, um, and 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 the whole issue of the Nile water and and, and all those things. And um, but um, um, just you know, in brief, I think um, there is um, definitely basis for the for the distrust. Uh, by the Sudanese streets on international and regional actors. And this is basically coming from the fact that they constantly feel um, that um, they are not regarded um, uh, as part of the conversation. Thanks, Hila. Um, before we return to 2021, um, I, I want to turn to Joe. Um, I think you were, you were sitting in Washington at the time that this was playing out. Um, and. Um, at a moment where conversations about global power competition and, and the role of various actors um, is, is incredibly live and, and in many ways um, centered Africa policy under the previous administration. So I'd like to hear from you about your, your perspective on this, the role that international, international actors played um, in that 2019 period. You know, I think when, when one looks at the, the US and the Troika, you know, I think, as I sort of alluded to before, very much informed by, you know, U.S. and the Troika's prior sort of engagement and, and thoughts on, on Sudan, especially the very contentious relationship that the U.S., Troika, other Western countries had with, with President Bashir and the NCP regime. And so I think it's key here to, to look at and to sort of mine, so to speak, what was public signaling and messaging and what were sort of private actions. I, I think, you know, when it came to public messaging, I think, you know, one one saw back then what, frankly, one expected to see and sort of what we're seeing right now in terms of, of statements, um, you know, condemning violence, um, noting the respect of the will of the people, noting that there is a close eye on what's happening. Um, you know, I, I think, those are things that will happen regardless, I think. And we've seen that for, for a long time. I think the Sudanese were very, very savvy and should take credit for this of watching and analyzing, parsing the public signaling from the US and others, um, you know, what, what meetings were held. I remember vividly significant outcry um, when there was a, a meeting um, with, uh, with Hamedi from the RSF in the midst of all this. Um, and I think that might have caught some people in the West off guard. The, there's the assumption, right, that it's important to have dialogue to discuss what's going on to keep channels open. But the Sudanese reaction to, to that, I think, was very, uh, was very telling and worth looking at as it goes forward. Is what, is, what is that public signaling and what does that symbolism mean? It's, it's very powerful, right, given social media and whatnot. And, you know, I think when it, when it comes to private um, engagement and messaging, I think we, we get to where, you know, both Kaduda and Hala ha have mentioned, you know, when, when diplomats, when special envoys engage sort of with parties, it's, it's extremely difficult, obviously. And it's, it's tempting and perhaps in some quarters understandable to want dialogue, to want mediation, to want negotiation in the interest of accommodation, of incremental progress. That is a normal um, diplomatic process. Um, managing the perceptions of that, incredibly important. Um, I, I wonder when one looks at, at those international diplomatic undertakings, I, I wonder what um, those actors think of that in terms of could more have been pushed for? Could there have been more time? Um, taken on this. I think, and again, Kaduta spoke to this a little more eloquently than I can, I, I think there was an understanding among 
among many in the West that there was a Sudanese way, so to speak, that there was a need for, given you know, the contested legacy of the military, uh, the need for this military civilian hybrid. And it, it's, it's not to me to sort of say that that was the original sin, so to speak. But I think looking at that and the international engagement with that, with that is critical. I think I'll note here is that one thing I think that through a lot of international diplomats for the loop is all of a sudden they were forced to engage with political and civic actors that they never really had engaged in a diplomatic and political way here. Here I'm talking about, um, you know, the sectarian political parties, the Communist Party, the Ba'ath Party factions, the FFC as a bloc, the SPA and the unions. You know, they're very, I think, unique and, and in some ways impressive organizations that I think required a real deep understanding of where they're coming from um, at that period. And I think that might have been a missed opportunity to really understand and, and have those actors understand where the U.S. and others were coming from. Mm -hmm. To go back to what I said before, I, I think one has to look at the, the U.S. and the Troika and others' relationship to the NCP and the Bashir regime. I mean, let's not forget that this all came in the midst of a push, an engagement between the United States um, and the NCP and normalization. That, that is all part of this. The pause on that, how that played out behind the scenes, it, it's not quite clear to me that that's, of course, part of this, this dynamic. I think I'll close by saying here that, you know, per perceptions matter. And I think there are more questions than answers on terms of how the military, the RSF, civilian so political elements really viewed, excuse me, the U.S. and others at, at that time. I think, I think some on the ground in Sudan might have thought it was a little too reactive. But I, I want to say something here that I've often sort of tried to think about and and I would urge Kaduta and Hala to, to let me know if I'm completely off base here. But I, I, I think that when, when political security actors in Sudan sort of really, when it comes down to when they have their backs against the wall, when really things are on the table, the either sharp gain or loss of power, I think in those moments, I think many on the ground got tunnel vision and that they look at this real zero sum nature of this and perhaps they don't, look so much at the role of the international community and what leverage the internationals may or may not have. I think they get very um, narrow in looking at how does one preserve those interests that are either on, on the rise or not. So I think that's worth discussing also in the context of um, how the military, um, after this most recent coup, how they viewed international messages and threats um, and so I'll leave it at that, but happy to hear from others on that last point. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. I think that the complexity of who the players are and the, the time and the creative approaches that are required to effectively understand and listen is something that, that we really um, can't, can't underestimate. Um, I do, I want to get to 2021. Um, uh, Susan, yes. can I jump here? Sure, Just, sure. Uh, yeah, I, I would just like to, uh, you know, to um, to speak about the political parties and political organizations uh, versus, you know, um, a very strong and structured power that has been in control for 30 years. And of course, you know, the international community, they would be much more comfortable, <laughs> you know, um, um, and, and, you know, and of course, you know, um, they you know, they have the capacity to engage with international actors as opposed to, you know, political parties who has been in hiding or scattered or polarized for years. Um, but I also think that there is, there is a long-term vision that's needed when we are looking and working on Sudan, you know, beyond what's comfortable for the technical arts of the international community <laughs> or not, <laughs> you know, and, and I think that's really very important um, um, to take into consideration. And I, I just like to stress that whatever has happened in 2019 under the circumstances and everything, I think it, it, it would be very difficult to assume that it could have happened differently, um, you know, um, in terms of the Pre preparedness and the readiness as well, 
you know, of, um, of Sudanese political organizations. Um, but I think, you know, something that, um, you know, that um, Sudanese have learned, and as I said earlier, which is really strikes me, how they have been patient and enduring with a transitional government. So, so that means, you know, that we are ready, you know, for the fact that, you know, um, democracy is a very long term process. It, it's not something that happens magically. Yeah. Thanks, Tila. I think that's incredibly important because our our anchor here is around the Summit for Democracy, not just around coups um, and around political transitions and how complex those are, how they don't move in one direction. They often move forward and they almost always move, move backwards. And, and the politics of that is incredibly complex to, to navigate effectively. So thank, thank you for bringing that forward. Um, Kududa, I, I want to turn to you because um, as we think about 2021, and let's be just academic here for, for a short moment, um, some people really claim that it's not just democracy that's contagious, but indeed coups are cont contagious across the region. Um, and that even if a country experiences a coup, it never really recovers and is in fact more vulnerable in the future. I'm not, I'm not quite sure that the academic literature bears this out, um, but there's certainly this sense that it's almost expected that if there's a coup once, you'll see it again. And we've talked about 2019, but of course, Sudan has seen many coups in its, its own history. Um, but Kaduri, you, you had a frontline view of what was happening in the, the transition um, in, in 2021. And this really delicate and maybe increasingly contentious relationship between security elements and the civilians and within each of those, those groups. So I ask, was, was the coup a surprise to you? Absolutely not. Um, you know, in fact, the government uh, had warned of the coup uh, weeks and months before the coup actually took place. Uh, in fact, even before the uh, supposedly failed coup attempt that took place a month before October uh, 25th. Uh, I think, you know, you're absolutely right. The, the legacy uh, of Sudan uh, and the involvement of the military. Sudan has been under military rule uh, for 53 of its 65 plus years of independence. And that legacy has created a culture within the military institution that it was in many ways made to govern. You know, um, and I think the important uh, context here is of the, the balance of power between the military and the civilians. I think, you know, the coup, planning for the coup, in fact, began on April 11th, as soon as the military deposed Bashir. Uh, in fact, June 3rd, the massacre of the uh, protesters in the sit-in was a coup in and of itself against the transition process and the negotiation. That was a coup attempt. And they attempted to govern. They, in fact, brought in the so-called uh, native administration. Uh, they said, we're going to create a transitional government. Uh, we're going to, uh, you know, create a, uh, or put in place a, a prime minister. And the balance of power shifted after June 30th, uh, in, which is arguably the largest protest in Sudan's history. Uh, we saw the military walk back and, in fact, come to the negotiating table once more. And as soon as the constitutional declaration or docu uh, constitutional document was signed, again, the planning for the coup, the coup began again. And we saw this in the, um, the, I guess, creeping into the role of the executive. And I think here the civilians have a share of the blame because the military under the constitutional document had, you know, its share of power was in the Sovereignty Council, which was supposed to be a ceremonial body. But as we saw from day one, the uh, military created parallel institutions uh, in order to make sure that it controlled the, 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 the trajectory of the transition itself. And I think, you know, uh, the military's number one concern has been the fact that it does not believe that it can actually function under civilian oversight. 
You know, I think any officer that goes through the uh, officer uh, ranks of the military and graduates from the military academy is trained to to think of civilian life as being disorganized. And the only way that Sudan can be managed is through the strong, orderly institution that is the military. And in many ways, you know, any officer that reaches the rank of uh, brigadier uh, automatically starts planning to, to coup. In some ways, a lot of people, there's this culture of the military having this, uh, uh, this destiny in some ways. The other thing was the fact that, you know, throughout the transitional period, there were certain benchmarks that needed to be met. Uh, and the most important of these is security sector reform and civilian oversight over military industries. And once the government started to seriously talk about these issues and bring these issues up, uh, it became clear that the military is unwilling <clears throat> to actually give up its control over uh, these, these um, big corporations and companies. Um, and I think here, you know, the drivers of the 21, uh, coup uh, had their roots back in in 2019, um, and of course we knew that there were certain issues that that you know were coming up. For example, the transition of the presidency of the Sovereignty Council, uh, which uh, you know was supposed to happen either in November 2021 or in uh, mid 2022, uh, was a serious point of concern for the military. Uh, the issue of, of accountability and justice, that was also something that kept coming back up again and again. And it was very clear that, you know, uh, the, the coup was a way to, you know, abort that. And I think finally, the success in some ways of the government's uh, reforms, it was clear that by, you know, July and August 2021, Sudan had reached you know, the, the plateau, if you will, of the economic crisis and had begun to enter the phase of stability and eventually, uh, starting next year, uh, of, of, of uh, economic growth. And I think it was clear that the military wanted to intervene just at that point in order to make sure that credit for the economic recovery, which is inevitable because of the reforms that were put in place by the civilian government, uh, that credit goes to the military. When in fact, obviously all of that was put in place as a result of the Sudanese people's patience during the past two years because of these very difficult reforms that really were born by the people in the form of very severe austerity, uh, the, the rationing of uh, subsidies, the uh, you know, unification of the exchange rate. These are very difficult reforms. And the people were willing to give the government a chance to implement these policies. But now the military basically allowed the civilian government to remove Sudan's name from the state sponsors of terrorism list, begin the process of debt relief and arrears clearance, uh, stabilize the exchange rate. And now the military, once that difficult set of reforms was implemented is now ready to take over and it was it was clear and i think the final thing which made it clear is that the context regionally i think the ongoing civil war in ethiopia gave cover to the military thinking that you know the region is so uh, enmeshed or, or concerned with what's going on in ethiopia that there wouldn't be much interest in actually countering the coup and of course the series of coups that had taken place before then whether the coup in uh, in mali the coup in chad the coup in uh in uh, guinea so possibly seeing that as kind of momentum the military uh you know made it clear that their interest is in, in cooing uh, and and i think the final thing domestically was the the initiative that was started by Prime Minister Hamdok uh, really put them on the on the defensive because that put that started to do two things. First, it started to raise the concern of the security sector reform as a question, and uh, it laid the groundwork for the unification of FFC. You know, 
FFC by mid 2021 was very fragmented. But in September, FFC had signed a uh, political declaration, uh, which brought back the Umma party, for example, one of the biggest uh, parties in Sudan under the umbrella of FFC. It brought all of the RSF, save for uh, the SRF, sorry, the, the, the rapid, the, the Revolutionary Front, save for uh, the movements led by Minni and Jibril. And that made the military very concerned because if people started to unify, uh, then then they won't be able to coup very easily. And finally, you know, again, going back to this question of the transition, if the uh, Sovereignty Council had gone to the civilians, then there would be no excuse, uh, you know, it would it would definitely be a coup because they would have removed a civilian head of the Sovereignty Council. Because the military was in charge of the Sovereignty Council, they can simply say, oh, this is just a change in government. Uh, so there were many factors, I think, that made it clear that this is this is coming. Yeah. Kadud, I think that's, I mean, it's a really interesting um, and maybe a bit of an academic debate about when is a coup a coup. Um, and uh, that's, is, is something that's that's very live in the conversation. Um, I also want to acknowledge that we don't we don't have anybody from the military represented here today as part of this conversation, and that I think we would we would welcome at any point um, a follow on discussion to to hear directly about some of the the calculations, the concerns, the fears, the the vision, and the perspective. Um, something that's always struck me is that there are a number of former military officials who have who have been advising and thinking through this pathway towards some sort of security sector transformation. And I think those are voices that, that we really value hearing from. Um, and that I think as we, as, as Sudanese negotiate a way forward, um, it's not just a, a single conversation. It, it involves all of those complicated conversations that took place during, during the revolution as well. Um, Hello, we've heard a lot from Kaduda in terms of, of the drivers. Um, I'm, I'm curious if you agree um, that the coup was not a surprise. And, and if you can share anything about your, your insights on what, what shifted in terms of either people's aspirations for what they hoped to see in the transition. Um, and then the organizing that was taking place in both civic and political spaces to, to safeguard or to resist or to respond to or address um, the coup that, that seemed to be on people's radar and, and on the horizon? Well, um, for me, I think the coup was a surprise and not a surprise. It was not a surprise, um, you know, exactly as Kududa has said, um, you know, we are dealing with um, an institution that's accustomed to a structure around privilege. You know, particularly when it comes to economic privilege, access to resources, lack of accountability, um, and so on. So this is how the uh, Sudan military has been functioning um, for decades, um, and uh, um, and and it's basically happened because uh, you know they were uh, assigned um, assigned themselves, you know, by the by the power they hold as the guardians of the states. And, and, and so on. But also I'd, I'd like to highlight something very, very important, you know, which is the phenomena of, um, you know, of uh, the SLA and uh, um, the justice and equality movement joining forces, which is, is, is basically speaks to uh, a mindset, you know, that's actually being shared among you know, uh, militarized um, groups, uh, whether being um, in the opposition or being part of the state structure. And this is something that I've always, you know, for me personally, I'm very interested in because I, I've, you know, we have done research and we worked with women who lived under um, armed groups, controlled areas. And um, we saw the level of repression that's happening, you know, not only to the women, but also to the youth, you know, to other groups. Uh, and yet, you know, um, um, thinking about, you know, the four or, you know, Nuba Mountains or Blue Nile or, or other areas, the, um, the violation that keeps occurring within those territories, you know, um, we always saw as a feminist uh, groups and, and, you know, myself, we saw that it mirrored you know, the same 
type of violation that happens outside of that. However, you know, um, there is um, this notion that as long as you are opposing, you know, um, Bashir's regime, that means, you know, um, you are exempted from accountability. And so we ended up, you know, in this um, um, very strange setup that we are rewarding through what's called peace agreements. You know, we are rewarding, um, you know, um, militarized elites who committed massive violations uh, by uh, giving them power, by giving them positions and, and giving them access to resources. So there is no um, surprise actually that, um, you know, they were really easily because, um, you know, integrated into the current um, um, structure. So, so that's, uh, that's, I think, is, um, is something that's very, very um, important um, to, um, to pay attention to um, in, um, in, this, um, in this conversation. Um, there is a, another question, if I'm looking for it, <laughs> if you remind <laughs> No, it's um, I, I'm I was curious if you noticed any change in terms of the way that that people were organizing to either continue to hold the space for democratic transformation or to resist the risks of of a coup or of this this exercise of power. Okay, yeah, so so, so fantastic. So so basically, you know, it's uh, it's absolutely a military coup, and I would like to say that, you know, adding Adin Hamdok. To the equation, you know, it's still poisoned. It's still a coup, you know, and it's not going to help. It's um, and and I and I and I talked earlier about. I was surprised. So the element of me being surprised, it's coming from the weakness of this structure. You know, historically, all the military coups that are taking place in Sudan, they don't uh, successful coups. I mean, um, um, and, and basically, if we look at 1969, Numeris coup who took, um, who ruled Sudan for, um, for 16 years, you know, and then, um, and then after that, Bashir, you know, those military coups, they come with their own, uh, political incubators. They come with their own constituencies and they come with their own roots on the ground. This is the most random, uprooted, you know, coup. I would say I have seen in the history of Sudan. It doesn't have a political incubator. It doesn't have any um, support, um, not only politically, but I mean, even ethnically. <laughs> It's extremely random, you know, and very uprooted. And it's very difficult for it to identify with any faction of the Sudanese people. And it's it's really telling that, um, and I'm quite surprised, you know, I'm, I'm literally surprised by the, um, you know, by the choices that Abdullah Hamdok has made, you know, um, um, joining this, um, this, and, and so, so, so I'm thinking, is it he himself internalizing the idea that he as the man, as the one man, you know, um, would make a massive difference, <laughs> which is, it doesn't make any sense. It's absolutely irresponsible to think that way. Um, military coups, in Sudan, who come taking advantage of political organizations, very strong political organizations like the Muslim Brotherhoods, at the end of the day, the military ended up, you know, having the upper hand on the military organization because then you are positioning yourself in a power equation that it, it you cannot match it under any circumstances as a political institution. And, and that keeps happening, that the military, you know, um, they utilize, um, you know, uh, political, um, uh, political groups and so on to take control. Uh, but that's very interesting that they assume that they could utilize uh, one person who himself doesn't have any affiliation to any of the political structure in Sudan. So, so on the other hand, I'm, I'm quite um, surprised that actually um, um, this coup is happening from, from that. 
it's um, fascinating that in these moments of crisis, um, the decision making is always complicated to track. Um, and Joe, I, I want to turn to you because um, I think if we look at the regional and international dimensions of, of this, you know, the, the African Union Peace and Security Council again suspended Sudan. Um, they met recently and they um, deferred the decision about whether to reinstate Sudan or not after this latest agreement between General Burhan and, and Prime Minister Hamdok. Um, Others in the international community um, seem to be sending signals that this may be the best pathway that Sudan has forward. Um, and, and there's been a lot of writing about the decreased influence of international partners to shape where, where this, how this developed and, and where it's going. And so I, I'd love to hear some of your reflections on in this, again, in this moment of global power competition in this, um, the regional dynamics that Kaduda and Hala and you have talked about, um, what's, what, is, what is driving right now? And what should, be, what should we be watching in the coming weeks about where this, this agreement may land or may not land? Very briefly, I, I want to sort of double down on something Hala mentioned because it's absolutely important. And it's been, frankly, I think overlooked is the armed movements and the Juba Peace Agreement. I think, you know, looking back at U.S. and international engagement in peace processes in the Sudans, plural, I think that basic assumptions of international actors about the nature of armed movements and rebels, I think there desperately needs to be a relook at those assumptions. I mean, obviously gone are the days of viewing them as good, bad, as, as that split. You know, I just think that we absolutely need to, to look at that again. I think, you know, what's fascinating is that was frankly a military to military negotiation. The, you know, RSF, the SAF, um, you know, really militarized elites in South Sudan, the armed movements. And I think that relatively went, went unnoticed. And what does that mean? What does that mean for the Sudan, South Sudan dynamic? Again, very overlooked, but, but extremely critical. And I think is going to play a, perhaps a greater role um, as this goes forward. I think it's absolutely fascinating that there's been some very good academic research and, and activist sort of messaging on the fact that, you know, the legacy of internationally mediated uh, peace agreements and peace processes in, in the Sudans has basically failed due to sort of the focus on power sharing, elite bargains, sort of commissions and institutions that never get off the ground. What does it mean that the Sudanese and the South Sudanese brokered an agreement that basically mirrored those internationally brokered peace processes. I think that's that's worth a PhD. Kaduda, looking at you here, if you want to go back to, but it's it's just really critical, and it raises so many questions that are hard because it's so easy for international community diplomats to say we have a peace process, we've got benchmarks, you know. The, but unfortunately, this it's such a sort of ethereal debate that I just hope there's space for that because it's. It's really, really complicated. You know, I think I think a lot of the pathways forward are going to be um, in Khartoum, in the big cities where protests are going on, in places like Darfur, because I think what will perhaps drive what's going forward is the uh, semblance or reality of unity among civilian political actors, among military actors. Not, again, to go back to the armed movements, I was really, really struck. I was able to go to West and Central Darfur in August. We met with the armed movements. A lot of divergent opinions, a lot of uh, difference of opinions among their leadership in, in Khartoum, among the stakeholders on the ground, uh, not even to mention sort of IDPs and, and more politicized civilians. And so, um, you know, I think if one looks at the political civic landscape right now, the street, the resurgence of the NRCs, the sort of Sudanese political elite who had tried to broker a Sudanese um, mediation of what happened. Um, I think looking at sort of that from the coup until now, what is the level of unity? And is that level of unity going to keep decreasing? Is it possible to roll it back? Because I think the fundamental unity, cohesion among civilian elements will be key to, to this going forward. I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm that optimistic that the level of uh, 
civilian political unity will will increase or 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 pause for now and and sort of you know i think what what i mean by that is there's a, a great desire among internationals to say Sudanese led processes are the best. I, I, I'm not going to disagree with that. But what does it mean that there were a few Sudanese led processes from the, the day after the coup up until the, the meeting with Hamdok? Was that a positive Sudanese led process? Again, not, not really for me to say, but, but what, is, what does that mean that there are there? perhaps isn't as much unity as one would like among the civilian political elements going forward. What impact um, is that going to happen? You know, I, I think it, it's it's really complicated about this, the level of sort of regional influence, great power competition. I think, you know, it's difficult. Example is um, last week, there was a UAE um, National Day, the 50th anniversary of the UAE here in Washington. And and at an event like that, you know, it, it's it's hard to see how an issue like Sudan rises to the top of, of of these agendas of these great powers. Yet we see we see them having an impact on the ground, the regional dynamic. And I think that it's it, it's incumbent on the international community um, to to sort of walk and chew gum at the same time to do more things at once. I think there's need to be greater example of engagement with the political elements of Khartoum, with the civilians of Khartoum, with the street, sort of look at what that means. And then also, you know, make that more diplomatic engagement with the AU amidst the great crises in the horn, more engagement with the Gulf. It's, it's hard, right? These are, these are multiple strands of a complex problem. But I think as both Kaduda and Hala have said, when Prime Minister Hamdok released that new initiative in, in June and July of this year, he, I think it's a seminal political document in, in Sudanese political history. It's one line. He said there is not only divisions between the military and the civilians, there's divisions within the military, there's divisions within the civilians. It's that that level of complexity that that the internationals, I think, need to engage on because, you know, I think, again, these things can be very, very zero-sum and we need to try to help preserve any semblance of unity that there is now. So in the 10 minutes that remain to us, um, I'm going to ask um, all of you who have this incredible depth of, of understanding of that complexity and ability to ask um, really incisive questions um, to think of our audience who may not know Sudan all, of that, all that well, um, who may be in a position to make policy decisions or influence policy decisions. Um, and so we're going to do a little bit of a lightning round and we're going to focus a bit on what external actors can be doing. And all of that said with a, a clear recognition that um, Sudan's political future belongs to Sudanese and also an acknowledgement that what others do will fundamentally shape what that, what that looks like. Um, so I'm going to um, go quickly to each of you on, on each of these and would ask um, if you could be as, as quick and concise as possible, recognizing that we're, we're missing a lot of, of, of the nuance that's necessary. Um, so my first question is, if you could identify one thing that could have been done differently to avoid the coup on October 25th, um, by the United States, an international partner, even, even USIP, we'll, we'll put ourselves onto the table. What would that be? Kadud, are you willing to lead? Sure. Uh, I think it's difficult to window it down to one thing, uh, but um, I think broadly, broadly, Initially, from the get-go of the beginning of the transition, the civilian government needed significant support. And I'm talking here financial support. And the reality is for a good year and a half, the government was forced to deal with all of the economic challenges Sudan faced mm -hmm. uh, by on its own. And to put mm -hmm. the burden on the Sudanese people, the delays that were... Uh, you know, the, the foot dragging, frankly, on the removing of Sudan from the SSTL, mm -hmm. that really put so much pressure on the, on the Sudanese government. I think, you know, this whole wait and see approach, you know, the people had come and agreed this transitional process. And, uh, you know, the international community should have really been forceful in, um, you know, giving the civilians this, this, um, 
this push. But I don't want to put it just on the international community. There's there's domestic dynamics as well here. I think there was significant political capital in the hands of the civilian government that wasn't uh, properly expended. You know, mm -hmm. putting pressure on security sector reform. Mm -hmm. That was the number one key to prevent the coup. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'll stop here. Thanks, Kuja. Hello. If you could identify one thing. Right. I'll, I'll add, identify one right now that the international community should do. You know, one, that we are still um, being controlled by a military coup, that adding Hamdok to this, I would say, rotten recipe will not make it not coup. It's a coup, you know, and um, and it's uh, it's absolutely engineered and controlled by the military. It's based on the 14 articles of agreement that was signed between Hamdok and the military, which is absolutely giving the military the upper hand over every single detail of the state, from the judiciary to the economy, you know, to the justice, to every aspect of life. My last message will be that Sudan is the vast and complex country. And, um, you know, as Americans, you know, you understand very well, you know, the value of decentralization and the value of pluralism, you know, and, and just try to reflect on that on, on a country like Sudan. You know, um, we definitely need to, you know, support Sudanese people to reach out uh, or to reach into um, a, a path or to craft a path that would enable them, you know, to reach uh, um, a, a level of stability. And it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be smooth. It would be very turbulent. But we need that support to reach um, there and 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 I think that's uh, that's that's really very important. There is, it is as I said, it won't it won't be easy. And I think that's not only good for Sudan. I think Sudan is much easier case compared to other uh, countries within the region. And I think investing in Sudan will definitely long term influence the region. Yeah. Thanks, Helen. Joe, over to you. Yeah, you know, I just think uh, as soon as the coup happened um, in October, people said we have to go back to the day before the coup. The the transition before the coup was in grave it was it was tenuous, it was fragile, it was in jeopardy. And you know, why if this following statement is true, why did it happen? Why was there a sense that it was just the civilians versus the military? That's way too superficial. And why wasn't there a, a greater recognition that? Institution building was frozen. What happened to the legislative council? Um, you know, what about the status of the Tan King, Tan King committee? I mean, all their things were not going well. And I think, you know, perhaps what if might clouded clouded the vision among the internationals is this was not a civilian led transition. It was it was a hybrid by design. And I think that there might have been a little bit more of wishful thinking than necessary about the level of who was leading this and what that meant. And, you know, I think labels and words matter in that, you know. Well, thank you to all three of you. Um, I know that we uh, tried to boil something incredibly complex down to some, some quick ideas and recommendations. Um, but I walk away um, with a pretty clear message that in addition to asking why all the coups, we also need to be asking why all the resistance, why all the Democrats, why all the social movements, why, why all the political parties. Uh, and if we really want to get to the heart of what does that incredibly messy, incredibly courageous, incredibly long-term work of democratic transition, political transition looks like, and we have to be asking about what happens when people exercise power uh, in lots of different ways. So, so let me thank all of you uh, for, for your generosity of, of insights. Uh, I hope we can, can have a follow-up conversation at some point with, with colleagues from the security sector, from the political parties, from the armed movements. Uh, and uh, to our Sudanese colleagues, we, we wish you um, good courage uh, in this, this time of, of political transition. So thank you, everybody. And thanks to everybody who joined us today. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Bye -bye.